Welcome. Thank you. It's so great to see you. Great to see you again. Uh, there's so much here. We really we need an hour to get into all this. We only have uh, 20 minutes. So I want to begin where you begin. Uh, you describe a flashback you had in acting voice class. Mm-hmm. Um, can you set the scene for us? You're there in voice class. You're on the floor. What happened? Set the scene for us. Yeah, so it was like in the first month of theater school. And as you can imagine, part of a very important part of theater training is voice training. Mm-hmm. And so, yes, I was on my back on the floor. And I had a flashback to uh, a very violent rape that I experienced when I was 13 years old at the hand of the paper bag rapist who was quite renowned and infamous in Vancouver in the late 70s and uh, all the way to the mid-80s. He attacked, um, by his own admission, hundreds of children. Um, In terms of the police, they believe it was, what they have information for is about 180 children. Wow. Yeah, so I was attacked by him when I was 13. And that was the flashback that I had. Flashback might not be the right word because it makes it sound like I hadn't remembered it. And all of a sudden, you know, Mm -hmm. the memory came up. It was always very present for me. Uh, But that was the first time that it that it came up in the way that it did, which is, you know, I I literally relived it. Um, And so at that time, I was 22. I thought that that experience had expelled it from my body and that I was free of it from that moment on. (laughs) Only to realize uh, through the years that, that that was just the beginning of a long healing process around it. Why do you think that memory surfaced in that way in that moment? Uh, because um, to be an actor, um, you are the instrument, right? So it is your body, your voice, uh, your emotional and spiritual being. So acting school is about tuning your instrument, so lying on my back on the floor and breathing very deeply and exploring sounds um, and it's all about getting into the pelvis is what brought it up. Very spiritual experience. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you said you had thought about the assault before, um, but you had kind of pushed it away. Is that right? Yes. Well, I, like I said, I was 13 years old mm-hmm. when, when I was raped by the paper bag rapist. His name is John Horace Houghton. I was with my cousin who was 12. He attacked and chews. That was his modus operandi. And um, I come from a Chilean refugee family who, uh, you know, when we came to Canada, we literally had nothing. So what I learned from my parents and from the people I call uncles, aunts, and cousins who are the Chilean community in exile in Vancouver was that um, no matter what's happened in your life, you have to get up the next morning and go to work. There is no... um, we don't have the privilege of lying down and sobbing. Mm. And because I was raised by people who are concentration camp survivors and torture survivors who modeled that for me, that no matter what has happened, you get up and you go to work the next day. That's what I did. You know, I got home at midnight from the hospital and from the police station and I got up the next morning and I went to school. And um, I'm very happy that that's what I was taught. So it, it's not that I pushed it away, it's that I kept going. And it mm. is thanks to the theater training, the acting training, that I was forced to, uh, quote unquote, expel it from my body in order to be uh, a good actor. And is that why you wanted to start the book there with that moment? Because that was the beginning of your development as, a, as an actor? Yeah, well, I start the book there because I wanted to pick up where Something Fierce left off, right? And Something Fierce left off basically when I start to go to theater school. Um, Also, the theme of this particular book is healing from post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, So it was under that umbrella theme that I thought it made perfect sense to Mm. also uh, tell the story of the rape and its aftermath in this book. The other major experience that you had to open up and connect with in order to flourish uh, as an artist is your time in the resistance against the Pinochet dictatorship. Um, You went back to Chile as a a teenager. This is stuff uh, you've described in Something Fierce as well. You say you also spent much of that time in a state of dissociation from that trauma. Mm -hmm. Why was that experience so difficult to open up after it was uh, Uh over? The experience of being in the resistance? Yes. Yeah. So when I was in the resistance uh, as a youth, basically I spent my life living in a state of chronic terror. And that is very hard on the body and on the psyche. Um, so I was followed a lot when I was in the resistance. I, I was sure I was going to be picked up, tortured and killed many, many times. This wasn't, um, 
a far-fetched belief, you know, that was happening <laughs> mm-hmm. around me all the time. Um, and um, so, yeah, th- the way to deal with that was that I was dissociated most of the time that I was in the resistance. And again, if we go with the thesis that in order to be an actor, you need to be in your body and uh, in order to embody text um, and interpret text, I had to figure out a way to get back into my body. And in, in, in so doing, uh, I had to confront, again, the trauma of having lived in a state of chronic terror for most of my youth. How did dissociating help you cope up until that point? Well, um, I think it helped me cope with, um, by being numb, you know, uh, not feeling the terror that, that I had to deal with. Um, so it was about being numb, but being numb like that is also very painful. Like it was actually physically and emotionally and psychologically painful, mm. but I thought that was normal. So it took a lot of years to not be dissociated and to actually go, oh, I'm actually not in physical pain anymore. Um, and again, I credit theater school for all of this because they pulled me aside almost immediately after that infamous voice class and said, uh, it's very obvious to us that you have PTSD and uh, if you're going to make it through the program, you need to get therapy right now. Mm. It was kind of a condition of continuing in the program. Carmen, I couldn't help but think, you know, imagining you in theater school reading these sections, imagining you there having gone through these major experiences, traumatic experiences, um, in class with kids maybe just out of high school, Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> Maybe still living at home. I mean, you'd lived yeah. three lifetimes up yes. to that point. Yes. And not only that, uh, the majority, um, really, I would say, okay, let's not say 100%. Let's say 99% of those kids were middle and upper middle class white kids um, who um, really had no clue... <laughs> You, what, you'd how risk, to, how you'd, to connect with me on that level, on the level that we were talking about earlier. Um, and also I had taken an oath, right, when, mm-hmm. I, when I joined the resistance. And the oath said in no uncertain terms, you will never speak about this. It is much too dangerous. So I didn't, right? So the entire time in theater school, they had no idea. They all knew about the rape, of course, because, that, you know. That surfaced that in class. That surfaced. And other people in the class had experiences like that for sure, mm-hmm. right? Um, but, uh, in terms of the whole PTSD around the terror that I felt in the resistance, I, I, I had taken the oath not that long before theater school. So I was like, there is absolutely no way I will, I will speak of this. How did that feel? Was that incredibly lonely? In a way, yes. So I was dissociated for a lot of the time I was in theater school. I don't know how I made it through that program. They were just very generous to me. Mm. And I was also one of the only people of color in the entire program. And also the staff continues to be 100% white. Um, So that was also very isolating. Mm. Yeah. Uh, If you're just tuning in now, I'm Shad. You're listening to Q. And I'm speaking with actor, playwright, and author Carmen Aguirre about her new memoir, Mexican Hooker Number 1, and my other roles since the revolution. There's an experience with art in this book that really struck me. You describe going to see an underground play. This is while you're in the resistance. Uh, actually, you just sworn your, sworn yes. your oath to the resistance <laughs> 24 hours earlier. You go to see this underground play, this sort of illegal production, which is a big no-no for people in the resistance. Mm-hmm. You'd actually just sworn an oath not to do that. Yes. But you write that you were willing to risk everything to have a story told to you and that yes. it was worth it. Yes, why yes. was it worth it to, you know, when we talk about risking everything, I yes. mean, we're, we're talking about risking your life. Yes. Why was it worth it? Well, first of all, I was 18 years old. And when one is 18, sorry, 18 year olds, if anybody's listening here who's 18, you're just an idiot, right? Like you, you really are, right? You think you know everything. And I mean, when I think about the risk that we took going to see an illegal play, I just go, what an idiot. So that aside, yeah. uh, uh, yes, it was worth having the story told to me because it contextualized um, everything that I had just sworn to do. So in that moment, uh, I was in the middle of a breakdown. There's no other way to put it. Like after I took the oath, I cried pretty much 24 hours a day for 10 days straight because of, of the le- level of terror that I felt. 
Um, and this play, uh, which was mostly a movement piece, told the history of Peru, because this was all happening in Lima, Peru, during the Civil War there, where I took the oath. Mm -hmm. The Chilean resistance had its headquarters in Lima. Um, and uh, it just really contextualized why I had just taken that oath and that the story that I was involved in was much bigger than me, that I was there to just offer my grain of sand in, in the history, the ongoing tortured history of Latin America, and that that was worth doing. When did you know that you wanted to um, offer that grain of sand in a different way as an actor? Well, we lost the revolution in Chile. So a lot of people might go, what is she talking about? The dictatorship did fall. Uh, yes, the dictatorship fell in 1990, but certainly not the system that the dictatorship uh, had set up. And the system was neoliberal capitalism, which is very much alive and well in Chile right now. It's, as far as I'm concerned, it's one of the most capitalist countries in the world. Um, so that's why we felt that we lost the revolution. And um, my calling, since I was three years old, was to be an actor. And I had set that aside in order to join the resistance. Um, uh, I, I had also um, been offered um, a scholarship to study medicine in Cuba. And I had also put that aside to join the Chilean resistance. So when we lost, and I was still young enough to go to theater school, mm -hmm. I decided to follow that dream and that also created an inner conflict uh, within myself because I felt that that was a selfish dream. And being in the resistance was all about selflessness. So I really had to confront being selfish and um, plow through with that. When did you resolve that? It's still in process. Mm -hmm. <laughs> feeling much better about it That's a big one for artists. That's, a, that's yeah. a kind of a universal thing yeah. for a lot of artists, yeah. Yeah. Um, this book is called Mexican Hooker Number 1. Yes. And my other role since the revolution. And your uh, school directors are the people that kind of introduced this idea to you that your prospects as an actor mm -hmm. might be roles like this. Yes. What was that like, uh, having that conversation when you were in theater school? Well, again, when one is young, one is quite angry. <laughs> So I was quite angry when I had that uh, when I had that told to me in theater school by my directors. They basically said, again, in my first term, they pulled me aside and they said, "You are you absolutely sure you want to continue? Um, you do understand that it is a very racist business, very sexist business. Uh, you will probably only be playing maids and hookers." And they were right. They were a hundred percent right. I I am still playing housekeepers as we speak. Uh, I no longer play hookers because I'm too old. But <laughs> there, my, one of the roles I played is literally called Mexican Hooker Number 1. So if anybody wants to go to IMDb and <laughs> check my page, I did not make this up. It is called Mexican Hooker Number 1. In other words, it's so reductive that, you know, this character doesn't even have a name, right? Mm. She's not even worthy of a name. What do you think was behind that conversation? Do you think they were genuinely looking out for you and just trying to warn you? Or do you think they were trying to discourage you? They were trying to let me know how difficult the road would be. Um, and uh, I'm very happy that they did that now as I look back, right? Mm. And it was thanks to that conversation that I realized many things. I realized yet again that I'm a person of color because I forgot when I was in theater school because it was so white that I thought that I, uh, all that whiteness had washed out my color. Mm. Um, and um, that the only way to deal with the situation was to create my own work, which they facilitated for me. Okay, so you're, uh, you're in theater school, you're learning how to access real emotions, you're, real, you're, you're learning how to face up to these traumas, and you tell a great story about a performance piece you did in school <laughs> about the uh, political coup in Chile. Uh, as yeah. you're trying to work through all of this stuff, tell me about that. Yeah. So um, once I realized that I had to create my own work, I started to go, well, I don't even know what that looks like. Like, what, what is my own work? Especially since the most important part of my life has to continue to be top secret because I took an oath. So what am I going to do? Uh, so at theater school, uh, every term they had a thing called performance lab, which was basically for students to try out anything that they could. And we were really pushed to take a lot of risks in performance lab. Um, so I decided to tell a per the personal story of the day of the coup in Chile, which I did. And I learned a lot by doing that because my voice teacher, um, 
when I went up to her afterwards and I said, how was that? She said, well, it was great, but it was way too personal. And so that took me on a path of, okay, yes, that was very personal, but those are the stories I want to tell. So how do you tell them without them being about personal catharsis on stage mm -hmm. and about them being uh, about universal experience? And that's when I realized, okay, you actually have to heal <laughs> <laughs> from some traumatic experiences before you can put them on stage or write them down in a book for public consumption. Otherwise, it's self-indulgent and it's therapy in public and it's uh, about, uh, you know, you're asking people to witness your own personal conversation with yourself. I feel like this whole conversation is a big warning to anyone thinking of going to acting school. It is not, <laughs> it is not easy. Um, but why can't art be both therapeutic and uh, therapeutic for the performer and meaningful for the audience at the same time? I think it has to be the other way around. I mean, uh, if it's therapeutic for the, for the audience, that's fantastic. If it's therapeutic for you, it's self-indulgent. Mm. I'm being pretty extreme here, but that is my opinion. <laughs> I think it's a good. I think it's a good general rule. Um, but you decided to go up on stage in this uh, performance lab uh, uh, again. But this time, you decided to read from a pornographic novel. <laughs> again, this is a this space is to take all risks, very and you did. Infamous times at school. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Why did you do that? Well, then I realized at, on my journey. You know, there I am in theater school. So, you know, in the day, I'm doing Shakespeare. Uh, at in class and failing miserably at, miserably at that. And then uh, at night I'm going, okay, I have, to, I have to create my own work. What am I going to do? How am I going to do this? And then I was like, oh, God, okay, the rape. Good. Okay, let's start looking at that. Um, and then one of the things in voice class that you learn how to do um, is ha it's called a language code exercise, which, where basically you are asked to embrace text that goes complete, completely against every fiber of your being because as an actor, that's what you're supposed to be doing, mm -hmm. interpreting text. So I thought, okay, okay, I'll do a language code exercise. I know I'll go to an XXX store on Granville and ask for the vilest, most horrific, violent porn and read it. So I did, and it was truly horrific. It was basically about men raping uh, teenage girls and torturing them. And the girls are screaming no, but they actually mean yes. So I wow. did that. And uh, it was very successful because pe <laughs> the audience that day, which was basically the whole school, was like recoiling and covering their ears and shaking their heads as I'm reading this text. And I was like, wow, I'm actually embodying this. I'm not dissociated. This is fantastic. Up until the point I was kicked off the stage for being completely inappropriate. <laughs> It's a space to take risks, and <laughs> yes. you did. Uh, that performance did not go over well uh, no. with your teachers, but it was important in the development of your play, The Trigger, yes. uh, about uh, your sexual assault. Yeah. Why was it important to finally find a way to address that experience in your art? Um, well, I mean, I think that um, rape is a, a universal experience, and um, what I was always, again, we talked about when one is young, one is quite angry. So <laughs> I felt a lot of anger when I was young at how rape was depicted on screen, mostly on screen, um, which was basically that uh, it, it was sexualized. So it was usually titillating. And the woman or the victim was one, a one-dimensional victim lying on the floor as a doormat and that the rapist was a one-dimensional monster. And none of that interested me at all and made me quite angry. So I thought, well, you know, it's easy to criticize. How would you do this? So it took me a long time to come up with the concept. And I finally did come up with the concept of the trigger, which is that I would play both the characters, the rapist and the victim, um, and that they both would be as multidimensional as possible. Lots of people never get there. They never get to the point where they can face up to traumatic experiences like this. What do you think it is about you that has allowed you to get to this point? Well, I think it goes back to the beginning. I, I don't forget where I came from. You know, I don't forget whose daughter I am, whose granddaughter I am. I come from a line of, on both sides of my family, of very, very strong women and very strong people. And then I grew up in exile in Vancouver, 
uh, with one of the poorest demographics in the city at that time, which was the Chilean community in exile, uh, people who had literally just come from concentration camps, who had been severely tortured, and they showed me the way. Um, mm. They showed me the way just by working so hard when they got here. After you wrote the trigger, you actually confronted the man who sexually assaulted you back when you were 13 years old. Why did you decide to do that? Well, um, so that, like I said, there's hundreds of victims. Um, two of those victims, I am allowed to say their names. They've given me the okay. Uh, Laura and Allison, I know you're listening. I love you both. Um, they are two of my closest friends, and I met them through the parole hearings that he has every two years. So we've been going to his parole hearings since 1995, uh, during the rape, I never saw him because, I mean, he's referred to as the paper bag rapist because he covered his victims' heads with a paper bag or with uh, an item of their own clothing. In my case, he covered my face with my blouse. And uh, so I never saw him, never saw him. In the parole hearings, his back is to us, so I never saw his face up close. I never went to trial because the rape kit that was uh, performed by the hospital after the rape was never handed to the police. So there was no quote unquote evidence. Um, I was out of the country for the trial anyway. So it made sense to me that after 20 years of going to his parole hearings that uh, I wanted to see him face to face. So Laura and I went um, to meet him face to face through a restorative justice program. Mm -hmm. And um, it was absolutely incredible. It was a five-hour meeting to sit very close to him, much closer than I am to you right now, for example, and just look into his eyes for five hours uh, to even out the power imbalance between us, to have a conversation on, 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 on my terms, not on his terms. And um, it was amazing. I've always, I've always felt compassion for this man. From the very beginning, and the compassion only grew um, after I saw him. You felt compassion from the beginning. Yes. I mean, unfortunately, we only have, you know, 45 seconds here, but I need to know what you mean by that. I was never angry at him, and I never hated him. Uh, I, uh, rape is a very, for lack of a better term, interesting crime in that the person is using their body as a weapon against yours. So there is an innate intimacy in that. So to have somebody's naked body violating your naked body and to have their heart against your heart um, is pretty intense. Mm. So even in the moment, even though I was only 13, I felt his pain. And, wow. that, and so I felt compassion. Wow. Yeah. Uh, well, Carmen, again, it's been great uh, to have you here. I'm, I'm proud of you. I'm proud of this book. Um, and it's been a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you, Shad.